Hey, this is Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan. Well, a lot of you guys wrote to us asking us to respond to The Magic Pill on Netflix, a documentary which advocates for eating a ketogenic diet high in meat and lots of other animal bits, while at the same time demonizing the way we eat, a high carb, plant-based diet, saying carbohydrate-rich diets are responsible for disease and obesity. So what I'm going to go through here is watch this documentary with you guys and see how accurate their facts and science are when they try to take shots at eating plant-based. Added sugar in everything. Ketchup, sugar, juice for the grandkids, sugar, 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 corn syrup. The applesauce is corn syrup? High fructose corn syrup is the second ingredient. I would have never guessed. Fructose? It's not going to be anything in here. So what you're seeing here is the producers are going through the homes of people who are trying to lose weight or have diseases and help these people get rid of foods from their kitchens that are not particularly healthy for them. And here they're going after refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup in ingredients in their foods. So yeah, not a bad place to start. What I wonder though, are the producers going to be against just refined sugars like these or do they have an issue with just carbohydrates as a macronutrient in general? Bread and other grain related products are really worrisome, A, because of their gluten issue, but most importantly because of their carbohydrate content. Oh really, so bread is bad too. Bread makes you fat. Bread makes you fat? What else are these producers against? I call wheat the perfect obesogen. Food perfectly crafted to make you fat. Oh really, so wheat makes you fat. Well, first of all, I gotta point out the obvious here. I hate to do so, but if he's such an expert in obesity, why does Dr. Davis have a triple chin? Since he's eating no wheat. Anyway, what he's saying here, how wheat is this perfect obesogen and makes people fat, well, this could be fact checked. So I tried to find the wheat consumption per capita by nation, had trouble getting the data on that, but I found such data for pasta, which is made out of wheat. And if you look at this chart here, Italy by far consumes the most pasta per capita of any nation in the world. So if Dr. Davis were correct, Italians should be quite overweight. In this article about obesity in Italy, they point out that unlike Americans and Westerners who swear by low carb paleo-like diets, Health conscious Italians eat pasta every day and get much of their energy from complex carbs and heavy starches like bread and pasta. Well, since Italians are eating all this pasta and wheat every day, they should be one of the most obese nations on the planet. Well, not so. The United States ranks number one. Nearly 34% of our population is obese. Italy, they're not even in the top 10. Less than 10% of their population is obese. So how do you explain that, Wheat Belly Dr. Davis? Why do you think pasta is such an obesogen? Wheat is in all frozen dinners, all breakfast cereals, taco seasoning, seasoning mixes, instant soup mixes, canned soup. So Dr. Davis is talking about, and the filmmakers are showing processed junk food here. For instance, Chef Boyardee and SpaghettiOs. Do you really think Italians are eating SpaghettiOs for their pasta? So if we look at the actual nutritional facts and ingredients list for SpaghettiOs, we'll see why the Italians are doing so much better than us. So there's a whole long list of ingredients here, processed, refined foods, dairy products, and other preservatives to keep this food safe in a can for a long time. And check out the nutrition facts. Nearly a thousand milligrams of sodium in one serving. This is not how they eat pasta, whole wheat pasta with tomato sauce in Italy. So processed sugar is bad, wheat and products made out of wheat like pasta and bread are bad. What else is bad according to this movie? If you fly from New York to LA, the majority of what you're flying over all those little circles and squares on the ground, that's America pumping out carbohydrate as fast as it can. That's the 30,000 foot view, that's what's happening, and that's reflected in our grocery stores. Oh really, so growing plants in America is simply reduced down to America pumping out carbohydrate as fast as it can. I mean, I don't even know where to start. This is just completely ridiculous. First of all, we have over 300 million Americans to feed. So unless you're advocating that we just eat meat, we need to grow a pretty large amount of plants. But the hypocrisy and ridiculousness of that statement is that Humans don't even consume the majority of plants grown in this country. It's consumed by livestock. 
In fact, Cornell ecologists have calculated that the United States could feed 800 million people instead of 325 million people if the grain that we grew for livestock were fed to people. So not only is this movie advocating that people eat more meat, it's a particular kind of meat, grass-fed meat. One of the ideas we threw against the wall and it actually stuck was that we were going to buy a grass-fed cow, a whole cow. For tens of millions of years, grasslands and ruminants co-evolved. Cattle are basically designed to eat one thing and one thing only, fresh green grass. And what do grains do to cattle? They fatten them up. We could take a hint from that. Are you serious? More misinformation, more carb fear in there. Countries in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, eat more rice per capita than anywhere in the world, yet they have the lowest rates of adult obesity. Roughly 97% of all the meat produced today is produced in these feedlots. Quite simply, what you're proposing here is just not sustainable. There's not enough land in this country or the world to feed its entire population grass-fed cows. Already in the United States, nearly half of the land here in the lower 48 states, I'm talking about 1.9 billion acres, is being used for livestock grazing. And it's also not sustainable because rearing cattle produces more greenhouse gases than driving cars does. Cows produce over 150 billion gallons of methane gas every day. And add to that, that methane is 25 to 100 times more destructive than carbon dioxide on a 20 year time frame. And methane has a global warming potential 86 times that of CO2 on a 20 year time frame. To make matters even worse, grass-fed cattle produce even more methane than factory-raised cows because grass is more difficult to digest. However, some have argued that this process of grazing grass sequesters carbon, making up for the difference in methane. However, studies have shown that's just simply not true, and the only way to make a reduction in greenhouse gases is to stop producing animals for food. The whole low-fat thing is completely wrong, so we're going to add more fat to the diet. Again, showing more junk, highly processed foods. Having the federal government get behind the low-fat diet changed vastly the food system. You know, companies flooded in with all their low-fat products responding to this huge demand. By taking fat out, you guarantee that people have to shift over to high-carbohydrate foods. That's just what happens? Nina Teichel is just simply lying there. The federal government never got behind a low-fat diet, and people are not now, as a result, consuming a high-carb diet. I wish that were true. The Food and Nutrition Board's recommendation for calories from fat is up to 35% calories from fat, 40% if you're a child. And that's not really pushing people to change their ways much, if at all, because already your average American is getting about 34% of their calories from fat. Whereas a real high carb, low fat diet, your percent of calories would be 25% or less. I think mine are about 15 to 20%. Our government has never suggested anything below 30%. The sad fact is Americans were eating high fat before these government recommendations and they're still eating high fat now. Oh no, I was a vegan. I was never a vegetarian. I went from standard American diet, vegan. Nice move, getting a former vegan into this movie. Let's see how they play this out. I'll tell you this, the context here. She went vegan and wanted to eat all her food locally, so she decided to grow her own food, but she encountered some philosophical problems when she went to the local gardening store. I go to the farm store and I'm looking around, and every single thing that's an amendment that is for fruit, like strawberries, um, it's bone meal and blood meal. And where does this bone meal and blood meal come from? What, well, it what? comes from, you know, from animals. <laughs> it's like, where it doesn't fall out of the sky? You know, like, I know this is about dead animals. It's horrifying to me, what do I do? So what she did do is start using these animal byproducts in her soil and eventually started eating animal products herself. What she fails to mention is that it's not necessary to put these animal waste products, that's what bone meal and blood meal are, they're just cheap waste products from the animal slaughterhouses. There's other ways to grow plants that don't involve putting dead animals in your soil. For instance, here's Bernard Ranches, one of our favorite farmers at our local Southern California farmers markets here, has the most tasty citrus around, bar none, and he uses no animal products whatsoever in his farming methods. I used to add uh manures but a lot of the customers are vegans and they don't even want manure animal manure so i don't i don't even add that anymore so the fertilizer i use seaweed well it adds every chemical to the on earth to the trees and pretty much in balance the one thing it lacks is nitrogen it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen and the trees need nitrogen 
So I add compost, mushroom compost. So there goes her argument how you must use animal products to grow food. Just pure laziness or just pure lies. I'm not sure which. Well, let's see what else they get wrong in this movie. Maize has become our staple food. It's called pup in South Africa. It's refined. It's high carb. You might as well be eating a bowl full of sugar. Nice job scaring people away from all forms of carbohydrates. Maize is corn and people have been eating corn and maize here for over 10,000 years. And it's not the same as eating highly processed refined sugar. One of the tactics that industry uses is they'll fund studies that are designed to confuse the record. For once, something said by Nina and this documentary as a whole is right on point here, but it's not the evil and corrupt banana or potato industries funding these studies. Basically has done a study that shows that people who consume eggs don't have a higher risk of mortality. Another study just came out with 44,000 people okay. that showed all cause mortality was less in people who and consume who one egg per study? day. But who that was in that, Iran. It wasn't that funded study? by industry. That was an egg that industry was, funded no, study. No, you guys but, talk about But the point unreal. is that unreal. you can unreal. cherry pick unreal. the unreal. And big kudos to Dr. Garth Davis defending himself and plant-based diets in general on the Doctor's TV show. And Garth Davis isn't the only doctor that has issues with these low-carb paleo diets promoting all these disease-reversing effects. The president of the Australian Medical Association called out this documentary's information for being patently ridiculous and harmful. And by the way, who is giving out all this information in this movie? Who is its producer? Is it a team of medical researchers, doctors, nutritionists? No, it's none other than a celebrity Australian TV chef who promotes low carb and paleo diets and cooking. And I have to agree with that president of the Australian Medical Association because Chef Pete Evans is giving out some potentially dangerous advice here. For instance, all throughout the movie, he tells people to eat meat and animal products if they don't want to have diabetes. Because the science shows just the opposite. In the Adventist Health Study 2, with 60,000 participants, vegans had by far the lowest rates of diabetes. Non-vegetarians had over twice as much diabetes than vegans. And as far as body mass index goes, yeah, vegans eating all those carbs. Pete says we should all be obese. Well, vegans were the only group to have a healthy BMI. The most overweight were, again, the non-vegetarians. And before any of you low-carbers try to complain that that study is some kind of flawed correlational study, there's plenty of clinical randomized trials, such as this 74-week clinical trial that shows a high-carb, low-fat, vegan diet is actually superior to the conventional diabetes diet. And followers of these low-carb diets might be setting themselves up for a heart attack, the number one cause of death in the Western world. Plant-based diets free of cholesterol and saturated animal fats have been clinically shown to help prevent and treat heart disease, even actually reverse heart disease, reopen back up previously clogged arteries. There is no other diet on the planet that can do this. Take note of that, low-carbers. And lastly, what I find most disturbing about this documentary is its complete lack of concern about the lives of animals. They make it sound like if you don't eat animals and get this precious animal fat so you can get into ketosis, you will be sick, you will die, you'll have all sorts of diseases, and that couldn't be further from the truth. There's nothing in animal products that you can't get from a plant-based diet, else all us vegans should be dead by now. And it's not just vegans making this claim. Check out the American Dietetics Association, the British Dietetics Association, very non-vegan groups, and they're saying the same thing, that vegan diets, plant-based diets, are healthy and appropriate for all people in all phases of life. But the message of low-carb propaganda like this is that animals need to die in order for you to live, and that's just simply false. I'm going to let you hear it right now, once and for all. Animals don't need to die in order for us to live. I don't give some major kudos to Angie for helping me make this video. We watched this Magic Pill documentary last week. We've been talking about it and the issues that have arisen from this documentary every day. So she really helped me to work these ideas out. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And speaking of watching this documentary, I see it's been trending on Netflix. So it's getting a ton of views. And did you see it? Let me know what your initial reaction was. If you're plant-based, were you outraged? Did you find it full 
of misinformation, potentially harmful and deadly information. If you're low carb, were you pleased? Did you find it to be satisfying in a, in a factual and scientific way? So let me know all your guys' comments down below. So until next time, guys, keep it carb, plant-based, keep it carb. Round.